We're uh, very pleased today to, um, <clears throat> to uh, in, have invited uh, Professor uh, Kathleen Fissler. She's a research professor and director of undergraduate studies in computer science at Brown University. She's been collaborating for several years with uh, Sri Ram Krishnamurthy on a course textbook and research program around data centric computing. Um, so that's a, a, a modern take that combines data science, data structures, socially responsible computing in a single curriculum um, that's accessible to majors and non-majors alike, um, particularly uh, pertinent to today's uh, webinar. She's also been a faculty lead in Brown's department-wide effort to weave social responsibility across their uh, CS curriculum, and that's what her talk will be about. Uh, both efforts draw on inspirations from her prior research and formal methods, software security, and computing education. So anyway, we're, we're, we're thrilled to have you here, Kathy. Thank you. Well, thanks to, to Lee and Peter and Yvonne and everyone else involved for the, the invitation. It's, it's fun to get to talk about this. Um, it's something I've been uh, thinking about in lots of different dimensions over the years. So it's been good to pull it all together. Uh, just to confirm, mm -hmm. you're just seeing my slide, right? You're not seeing other stuff in front of the slide. I can't tell which of my two windows you can see. Uh, uh, Kathy, I'm seeing um, everything. You, um, you're not presenter in view. Yeah. You're seeing presenter view. Okay. Mm -hmm. Correct. All right, so then I should move that to, um, to regular slide view. You'd think after all this time on Zoom, we would have figured out. Uh, there you go. Um, how to start all this off. Let's see, slideshow, try playing from, you're still seeing everything, aren't you? It just reverted back to, it, it was uh, just the slide of interest and now it's reverted back to presenter view. Okay, hold so on. It was, looking, to... it was looking better a minute ago. There okay. we go. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. That's looking normal. So you're not seeing the little images. No, of now, now, it, now it's perfect. Yeah. Okay, now good. Got you. Good. And I'm just going to open the Q&A so I can keep. Oh, but now I bet you see that too, don't you? Do you see the Q&A box? No, no ma'am. Oh. We we, we're, we're only seeing uh, your image and your slide. Okay, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. All right. So feel free to interrupt anytime, um, either, you know, stick a question in the Q&A or, you know, just shout out to me. I'm kind of looking at this sort of like I'm what I'm teaching class and, you know, taking questions as we as we go through this. So, you know, we, I know that there are lots of places thinking about ethics and what to do about it in computing education. So I'm not going to give you all the slides about why this is important. Um, but, you know, we're having these meetings as a faculty. And from the discussions that I've heard of from people at a variety of institutions, you know, the thoughts that we have on this are kind of varied and they look something like, you know, something like the following. Um, whether people are worried about the time they have, whether we're qualified, how much is this stuff real computer science? Uh, can't we just give everybody the ACM code of ethics and that'll take care of it? There's a lot of concerns that people are thinking about around this question of how do we get more ethics into the computing curriculum and how do we get to a point where more than the faculty who are willing to sign up for a talk like this are engaged in the, in the effort. Um, so I, you know, I appreciate that I'm somewhat preaching to the choir here because you chose to show up to the talk, but I'm hoping that I can give you some ideas about what we've been doing um, that's been, been helping and then um, we can we can take it from there. So sort of what I want to do is take these these points as we as kind of around and talk about them. Um, ah, somebody put in the chat the the philosophy department has to teach ethics. Mere CS faculty aren't qualified. I promise I did not set you up for this next slide. Where you didn't, uh, but yes. We're not qualified, um, you know, Toletep, Socrates, Ramagina, Confucius, right? Those people are qualified to teach ethics, not us. And I think part of the challenge here is that you know, the word ethics is kind of weighty. And I wanna suggest that one way to make progress is first of all, to have us frame this 
not as ethics, but as socially responsible computing. And I think that framing shift is important for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, ethic just sounds weighty, academic, and just, it just focuses too much on thought and, and whatnot. Whereas responsible sounds more mainstream. It's not as threatening as, as the term ethics. I think the other thing that's exciting is that when we talk about responsibility, now we're hitting into many kinds of CS activities that we might not associate with ethics. Things like protecting somebody's privacy is a responsible thing to do. Practicing universal design for accessibility, again, it's a responsible thing to do. Trying to avoid bias, it's responsible. And whether you would think of any of these as ethical decisions gets into theories of ethics and what is ethics for, and now you start to feel weighed down by all of them. So I'm kind of curious, uh, just you know, put answers in the, in the Q&A and I'll summarize them for you. What are some aspects in your own areas of CS where responsibility would seem to show up? Like other examples besides privacy and universal design. Anybody have other thoughts of other, other things? Okay, software correctness and reliability, responsible data use, medical device safety, database bias. Yeah, these are all examples of ways in which being responsible comes about in what we would consider normal computer science activities. So let me get back to my slide here. There we go. So what's important here is that these have technical components, not just social ones. And I think one of the first steps towards engaging more computer science faculty in thinking that teaching this is relevant to them is to focus on how responsibility shows up in technical settings. And it doesn't have to just be, just be social. So now, even if you could get your colleagues who are comfortable thinking about privacy, for example, they might still not feel that it makes sense for them to try to be covering any kind of ethics material. So when we, when we hear people say, well, we don't have time to do this. First of all, note that this can mean we don't have time to teach this or we don't have time to, to actually create materials and deal with this. One way to teach it is to create standalone courses. This has long been the model of doing ethics education around CS. There's a lot of literature on different courses that, that people have tried. But recently we're seeing some other models of how to think about this. One is um, something that Harvard has written a lot about, their embedded ethics program, where they hired a bunch of postdocs from philosophy and social science to create materials that they could put into their courses. And that's another approach you could take. Um, Brown's taking a completely different approach where we're using teaching assistants to do this. And there are obviously gonna be strengths and limitations to each of these approaches. I would argue that making a standalone course is quote unquote, relatively easy. You have to find one person willing to teach it. You have to figure out how to get students to take it, but it's not affecting the majority of the faculty. If you feel like we're beyond having standalone courses and we wanna do this more deeply, okay, we'll outsource it to the, to the postdocs. Well, that assumes you've got enough money to hire all these postdocs, which not all schools will, but it also limits the sense that the CS faculty thinks it's important. Students know we're outsourcing when we do things like this. So at Brown, we decided that having this be something that was deeply engaging our teaching assistants was a way to do it that signals it needed to be centered in computer science. Okay, so that's the, the model I'm going to, to talk about here. So 
Brown's program, we call it STA for socially responsible computing TA. Okay. And what these are, if you are teaching a, a course and you want to embed responsible computing content into your class, you get to re request one to two additional teaching assistants. In Brown's context, these will be undergraduates because that's how our teaching assistant program is structured. But the idea is these students are paid up to 10 hours a week to help you develop and run the social responsible part of your, of your course. They will assist in content design. They can assist in grading. Some of them lead discussion sections. It's really up to the individual faculty member how these students are gonna be, be engaged. But in parallel, they form their own cohort. They have a training program, they have support, they bounce ideas off each other. So they're both within and across courses trying to, to work on responsible computing content. Now, usually when I, when I talk about this, the people say two things. One is undergrad TAs, what are those? And the second thing I'll get is, but can you really trust undergrads to be active in, in content design? How much do undergrads actually know about all this content? So what we've been doing, we, we hire a pair of graduate students or postdocs who know technology ethics. They're coming from other departments or other programs. They actually work with and train these social responsibility TAs. But the, the, the folks from other departments aren't the ones primarily driving the content. And for us, I think that's really been, been important. Partly it's department culture. Brown runs their entire department on undergrad TAs. We have maybe seven or eight students per semester graduate students who are paid as teaching assistants. So using undergrads just fits into our existing model. At, at Brown, undergrads are allowed to grade everything. They can't be involved in making up final course grades, but they are allowed to grade homeworks and, and help mark exams. So that is not an obstacle for us. What we like about working with the undergrads is they have a better sense of what students, their fellow students are thinking, what issues are resonating with them? What things do they want to talk more about? What are they skeptical about? And they've also taken the courses before. So they know how the content from this course feeds into other courses. It's a lot of the same arguments that people have made for undergrad TAs in general, but I think they really shine. Another smile factor is many of our graduate TAs are not domestic and they've had different exposure to these issues than the undergrads who are um, either more domestic or volunteered to work in this role. So they're keeping up with these, these issues. And when we hire these undergrad TAs, we hire ones who can demonstrate that they're actively engaged in learning about these issues. Some of them are taking courses, they're doing second majors in science and technology studies, they're part of clubs or activism where they read a lot. So we're, we're getting students who actually often know more than the faculty do about many of these topics. Let me stop here and get a sense of what questions come up at, at this point. Are there things you wanna talk about or questions you have? So I've got a question. I apparently, I seem to have trouble typing into the Q&A box. Um, so of course we're a large state university, yep. right? With, with lots, of, lots of grad students and, and, and so forth. So, so one question was um, that, that, that I've got is, you know, how do you think that might change or do you think it might change our approach? And also particularly if we want, also want to do responsible computing and teach that to in, uh, in graduate courses as well. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what your um, setup is in ours. A lot of our upper level undergraduate courses are shared, like they're overlapping graduate courses, like the incoming master's students will be taking the same courses as the seniors. So a lot of this development work is, is done for both classes um, as we go. So that, that helps a little bit. Uh, you know, I think even if you're in a large, University, and I'm going to kind of get to this as we go further in the talk. 
I think a lot of it comes down to how you think about the pedagogy and how you think about bringing in the content. I think what we noticed with our faculty is many believed that it was important to move beyond the standalone course idea and put things in their courses. But in feeling overworked and not qualified, there was a sense that we had to get somebody else to help us do this. And we decided that engaging the undergrads was a really good way to get this off the ground. Now we quickly learned after year one that the undergrads needed a lot more supervision in this than I think some faculty hoped they would. And this is why we have now hired, we, we always have these two um, people from other departments with a lot of expertise in this who are directly working and supporting the undergrads. So the undergrads can come in and say, well, my class is gonna be doing a unit on such and such. I'm trying to find good materials. I think this is what we wanna do. And then they bounce ideas off of of these other two folks. So, I mean, and, and our classes aren't small. Um, you know, my, my current class is 240 students. My spring class is 450. And I kind of feel like once you get to that size, it almost doesn't matter whether you have 300 or 1,000 in terms of scaling these kinds of, this kind of content. So I don't know how much of a difference that actually is. Were you thinking about different issues, Peter? Excuse me. Were, we thinking were you thinking about, thinking about different issues, or with those the kind? No, of... no, that, that, those those are sort of what I had in mind. Where we've talked about before, we we we've got a, a project aimed at sort of scalable right, content right, right. delivery. I think you have a couple of questions from Ryan Lee. Yes, I do. So, um, Ryan, you made you made the comment that this leaves open the question of convincing more faculty. I'm not done yet. Okay, I've just gotten started with the the model that we've used for delivery but I'm gonna go much more into things that we've been doing to bring this closer to, to CS. Um, Ryan also asked, there will inevitably be overlap with politics. So how do you believe this should best be handled? This is something we worry about a lot. Something I think has been very interesting is our undergrads want us to be very political on this issue. Now, Brown is an extremely liberal campus as, as things go. So the students who are signing up to be responsible computing TAs, they kind of have this very clear sense of right and wrong and not embracing ethics and diversity and all that stuff is just, is just wrong. So they can sometimes tilt over the balance and start being more political than we, um, we want them to be. So I think this is where the faculty have to be comfortable saying, our job is not to tell students what to think. Our job is to raise issues for students and give them assignments that let them reflect on how they think these issues should go. It's not political for me to let you know that a data set can bias the outcomes. Whether you think that is something worth doing, I think just doing something about, I think that's up to an individual professional to make their own, their own judgment on. But yes, you do have to watch the undergrads a little bit closely so they don't get too political about it. Lee? Uh, yes, I'm glad you said that, Kathy. I think the way we tend to put it is we really don't think we should be telling students what to think, but we do have to educate them about how to think. And in particular, yes. we need to educate them to be alert or aware of the fact that ethical issues come up and they can sometimes sneak in in unexpected and surreptitious ways, and they need to constantly be on the lookout for them when they arise. Right, right. And the next section of the talk is going to go more into um, some of the actual things I've done in my classes, and I think that might give us a basis for, for going a little further with this. But in general, what have been some of our lessons? We're in year three now. So what were lessons we got from doing this in the first two years? One thing is really thinking about what the appropriate role of the TAs is in this kind of setup of using TAs. It's very easy to end, have them end up in a situation where they just become graders because we didn't design our assignments with more interesting things for them to do. If you end up handing out articles and saying, oh, write a reflection on what this article meant to you. Well, then the TAs who don't have training in grading um, humanistic or humanistic work are now being asked to do that. And it's a really bad, 
bed match. We also hear from our TAs in the social responsibility um, cohort that they feel peripheral to the rest of the core staff. They really want to be involved in making the connections between the technical part of the material and the social responsibility parts. They don't want to be kind of off on the side and said, here, go think about something that you could pull in here. They want to be on the ground as the, as the staff as a whole is figuring out what the assignments are going to be so they can, can participate in that. Um, both the undergrads and the faculty need crash courses in pedagogy. Um, to me, this is a no brainer, but I'm a computing education researcher. So, uh, you know, a lot of my, my colleagues have tried things in these, these spaces that really, they were never going to work from a pedagogic perspective. And it takes a degree of humility to kind of realize that. And I'm going to point to some of those a little later in the, in the talk. Not only can the TAs be more political, they do not understand the pace of curricular change in a university. Um, I mentioned to our cohort uh, a couple of days last week that I was giving this talk and he got very upset. And he said, we have no business having a talk about this because we don't we're not doing this well enough yet. And we had to step back and say, we know we're not where we wanna be at the end, but we have made progress and other people are interested. This is a constant battle we have with the students in this is they just think we can flip a switch and have the whole department now teaching you know half of our courses about bias and related issues. So it's just something to kind of setting expectations really matters when you're engaging, engaging undergrads. The practical problem, which is gonna set up the next part of, of this talk is in the first year, we just kind of hired these folks and said, figure out stuff you can put in your class. And everybody read about machine bias. Most of them read the ProPublica article on um, recidivism. And so some students said, well, you know, I saw this same article in four classes. Surely there's something different we can do. And we, yeah, we kind of have to be more intentional about all this. So what's happening now where Brown is, we have the infrastructure. Now we're working on curriculum. And I think that's where this, this really starts to come together. So as an example, here is a snapshot of the social responsible curriculum framework for my intro course. Okay, there's, um, I think, three more rows that don't show here. But I'm trying to give you a sense of how I am articulating the goals of social responsible, social responsible computing for an intro computer science slash data science course. So for example, I want students to, to understand that when we write down data, we're representing actual information. Some information gets masked and some information gets highlighted when we convert it into data. So measurably, what do I want my students to be able to do? I want them to be given a data set and be able to tell me what information about this context has been highlighted and what's potentially masked. I look at that as a very concrete skill that you need to be able to do to be a responsible professional working with, with data structures and, um, and data sets. Whether you think that something needs to be done with those highlights or admissions, that's where the value judgment part comes in. But this skill of being able to look at a data set and look at a context and say what's here and what isn't, that's somewhat apolitical or more apolitical than, than um, the value system part. So that's an example of a very concrete learning objective. And this is written in a way that I can write exam questions on this. And that was my goal for, this is new, something I've done in my course new this year is actually having testable learning objectives um, that I could put on, on quizzes and exams. We have a set of thematic areas that we're thinking about in our curriculum. So for each of these principles, which thematic area is that related to? So this first one is about power because whoever chooses how the data is structured or represented has power over what information gets suppressed and, and what doesn't. And then the last column is just my tracking of how is this getting covered, which homework, which lab, which lecture, things like that. Um, so that's, that's one learning objective. The, I want them to be able to look, looking in the second row, 
I want them to be able to assess whether a representation we picked for data is sufficiently inclusive. So what do I mean by that? Well, if I'm setting up a database schema and I do names as first name, last name, well, I've just knocked out South India and I've knocked out parts of the world where uh, people have more components to their names. Um, that's right there, a representation issue and an inclusiveness and a responsible development issue. It's a pure data structures question, if you frame it that way. Um, and there's a lovely series of articles. Um, these are like blog posts by developers. Falsehoods programmers believe. There's one about names. There's one about time. There's one about dates that bring up all of these concrete, realistic names, dates, and times that have to get encoded in programs that don't fit in our naive data schemas for them. So, um, so that's, that's something that I really like using in my class. Looking at inferences that could potentially get made is something I want my students to be able to start, to start thinking about. And I want them to have a little bit, this is an intro class, right? It's not a machine learning class, but I want them to have a little bit of an understanding about how decisions, decision making gets expressed in a program. Um, so these are all examples of the kinds of things that I'm trying to do. Now, this is happening in the context of a cross-departmental curriculum effort. So in the cross-departmental effort, um, there wasn't much that I could, this is a little tough for me to fit on the slide, but basically what we are currently working on doing is saying, if we were to look at what we want students to know coming out of the first two years of our curriculum, what would that list be? And the list is roughly what you, what you see here. So in the space of data and algorithms, they should know something about the nature of data, how it has life cycles, how it has provenance. They should know the basics of privacy and data protection. They should know about fairness and bias. They should know a little bit that you know, security is an issue and protection of information is, is important. There's things like how the information flows, automation, like all of these themes are things we want students to get within the first two years so that the upper level courses can now assume all of this foundation in designing their assignments. So in the future, the basics of algorithmic bias are something that anybody teaching a junior senior level course can assume their students will know something about. The faculty teaching the junior senior machine learning class, well, they can actually go in and show, look, algorithmically, this is how something like that happens. But coming out of the first two years, they're made aware that this is something that, that can happen. Lee? So Kathy, that's a very impressive list. I, I really like it a lot. Um, I, I wonder uh, first how it comes about and second, um, how it changes or how it doesn't change. So for example, um, you indicated using a first person singular that you created that uh, lovely little grid of issues and, and how you like them addressed. So when somebody else teaches the course, does that grid stay with the course or does it go with you? Um, if it stays with the course, I mean, is, is there a, a department-wide conversation about this? Um, mm -hmm. Is there a department-wide conversation about how it's all distilled into that first uh, two years list? Um, all that stuff. So this is still work in progress. Um, so right now there are two of us who teach this intro course. Um, so I'm assuming that we're both just gonna keep using this uh, because we've, we've been talking about it. Many of the faculty in the first two years are committed to this kind of work. So we would like to get to the point that we have documents like this for all the classes. And this is one of the things that the, um, the postdocs from other departments are helping us with. So the list of the departmental curriculum came about from two sources. One is we did some archeology span on what everybody had done in their courses and what kinds of articles and things students were being shown. And then we got the experts, um, you know, one of whom is a PhD in political philosophy and studies tech ethics. So she has a lot of 
a lot of theoretical framing on this, to think about what this set of issues should be. So this list is going to keep evolving. We basically have a core team of about three of us who are actively leading the cross-curricular component, so the blue box. And we will be putting things in and taking things out like you do with any curriculum as you go along. So I think the hope is that in the spring semester, we will get a couple more faculty to prepare these kinds of teaching documents for their courses. We are maintaining shared repositories of all of it um, and, and moving it along that way. So it's very early stage, but we are at least at the point that we're thinking about cross department curricula, which you know for me, I think is really exciting. When I mentioned that uh, students, that, that the TAs needed to learn some pedagogy skills, one of them is getting them to even frame what they want to talk about in the course through learning objectives, right? Because the typical undergraduate teaching assistant I get says, I want everybody to know about machine learning bias. Okay, but what do you want them to be able to do after that? That's not a framing they're used to articulating. So the pedagogy component, the, the training part of this has been teaching them to think in terms of these measurable objectives. Frankly, we're doing that with the faculty too, um, because a lot of my colleagues don't think in terms of writing these down as, as measurable objectives yet. So, so that's what's, what's happening. Um, Yvonne asked, are we gonna publish these skills lists? Maybe. Um, I don't want to speak for my colleagues having not talked about it. I'm certainly happy to, to publish and share mine. The actual uh, department curriculum that that blue box is based off of, that's actually a, like a snapshot of a 40 row um, Google sheet that breaks each of these topics down into subparts and questions and, and motivating ideas. Um, that's probably still considered pre-alpha, um, but you know we are working on it and we are committed to sharing out what we're trying and, and figuring out. So, so I assume my co-developers of that would be willing to, to let us share some of this. Are there other questions on, on this curricular part? I'm still gonna give you some very concrete examples and a couple slides of what specifically I do in my course towards some of these. So that's still coming. Okay, well, I will assume you're gonna keep asking questions if you have them. So I will, we'll go on here. Now you still got the faculty who are gonna say, come on, this isn't real CS. And first of all, when somebody says that, I ask them to step back and say, well, what is this here? Is this mean, discussion of ethics, because you're all still, you know, talking to me bias and, and stuff. And I don't know that that's not CS. Is this mean it's not real CS to raise awareness about this to our students? Maybe this is discussing how technical design decisions impact social considerations. And I think if this is the third one, it becomes really hard to argue that this isn't about computer science because we teach students to make design decisions to achieve goals all the time. We pick data structures, we choose algorithms, we analyze for efficiency. What we're doing is bringing another dimension into the criteria that we should be thinking about around data structure and algorithms. I think you saw this a little bit reflected in the learning objectives I set up, right? Is this data representative of a situation? That's very much a technical style question, except now what we're trying to make sure it's representative of has something of a, of a social impact to it, not just say a, a performance one. So let me give you two examples. Um, these examples are both from not the class I gave you the little snippet for, from, but from my second semester course. So my second semester course is where we teach object-oriented programming, data structures, data structure implementation, and basic graph algorithms. Okay, so the students coming into this have had one semester of prior computer science and functional programming. Um, and I'm now scaling them up and introducing them to basic 
object-oriented software engineering, data structures, and algorithms. So I give them a project, a little discuss with your neighbor problem in class. I tell them, you've been asked to design a video recommendation tool. A user is going to enter search terms. The tool is going to return a sequence of videos to show. So kind of think YouTube. Um, and the recommendations are going to be based on what similar users have watched. So I show them this little arc, this little like flow diagram on the top. And I say, this is, this is what we're trying to build. And so you have to do something that produces the first video, but then also gives the sequence of next videos to show. And when I ask the students is, now you're gonna make a proposal for what data structure we need here. This is, this is just a design question. Are you gonna use a decision tree with videos down at the leaves? Or do you wanna use a dictionary or hash table where query terms are matched to sets of related videos? These are two proposals. These concepts of decision trees and, and uh, hash tables mapping terms to output is something they've seen. I'm now asking to apply it to this problem. So now I'm gonna turn this all to you. Do you have a preference between these proposals? And what features of each of them are you considering when you make your recommendation? Play undergrad for me for, for 30 seconds. And put them in the, put them in the chat. Okay, Ryan asked a clarification question. How do we decide what videos get put in the leaves or into the set of related videos? Um, that's gonna be a separate part if you're actually building the system. Right now, this is a data structure design exercise. So I'm only having them think about good data structures for storing all this information to support the activities of searching and getting back that sequence of videos. You're not saying anything in the chat. Do I have to send you into breakout rooms and make you talk to your partner? Take out your clickers. Or if you're confused, you can ask a question. Sure, so one, one, one. One of the things I'm thinking about is the rabbit hole phenomenon and which of those two data structures would be more dangerous um, okay. in leading you down a rabbit hole. Which of these would be more dangerous in, in leading you down a rabbit hole? Yeah. So one of the things that I like to point out at this point, yeah, or an echo chamber. Good. So in order to get similarity, look at the privacy concerns. What I love about this exercise in my class is alongside this, I present them bits from a, uh, a talk slash article by Donna Boyd called The Fragmentation of Truth. It's a lovely article where she dissects YouTube's recommendation algorithm and all the ways in which the recommendation algorithm has deep social impact flaws. But what's interesting about this is you can trace some of these issues to a naive configuration of this data structure. If you are thinking in terms of the hash table from terms to sets of related videos, and your whole search is gonna stay contained in that set of related videos, you have just hard coded a filter bubble in your, in your code. You have to do something very intentional and very careful to not fall into that gap, to not create the echo chamber. It's not that the decision tree is that much different, except the decision tree does at least have a chance to statistically adjust if it gets recomputed. And the point of this is not to actually have them make a choice between these two proposals. The point is to get them to realize 
that a data structure decision that they feel comfortable making as a second semester first year encodes social impact dangers. My sense is a lot of our students say, yeah, you know, this machine learning, this bias stuff, it's big, it's bad, but until I'm a manager at, you know, Google, Facebook kind of place, I have nothing, there's nothing I play, I play no role in this. And what I want them to understand is they play a role in this from the decisions that they are learning to make in my class as first year students. You pick a data structure that's got priority in it, like a priority queue, you are hard coding some decision about what is more valued than others. And depending on the context you are in, there could be serious social nuance in that predicate that you write. So this is my avenue into tying this deeply to technical content and to making it real to students at the point that they are, are working in right now. Uh, I see there's a comment here, apart from the data structures, uh, this is from Bev, worrying that recommendations from users might lead to people going to the most popular video. Sure, there are all of these issues. And for students who are interested, you can then point them to articles and say, look, this is how you actually have to think about such systems so you don't create these problems. But my big goal here is to make them realize that the work they're doing right now can create these problems if they're made naively. And I think this is part of how we communicate to our colleagues as well. It's not that our students are kind of disconnected from these issues until they suddenly become professionals and are five to 10 years out. We are teaching them to make trade-offs right now that if not thought about can contribute to these kinds of impacts. So I think it brings the responsibility home to, to faculty and to students. It doesn't make it any easier for faculty to figure out how to do this, but I do think it makes it, it, it makes it harder to ignore that there's an issue here. It makes you squirm a little bit, I think, to have to think through some of this. All right, I'm gonna show you one more example. This is another example from the same course. At the very beginning of the course on the background survey where I'm getting to know who they are, I ask them this question, which is up on the, on the top above the bullet. What would it mean for a restaurant rating app like Yelp or Dajang Yangping, which is the Chinese version of Yelp? What would it mean for this to be fair? That's the entire question. Open-ended, fill in the box. What do you think it means? And then my uh, responsibility TAs comb through all the answers and pull out a variety of responses. So we pull out about a dozen that represent different perspectives. So for example, here are three of the ones that came up recently. And these are direct quotes from, from students. A fair system denies restaurant owners the ability to remove or edit. I'm sorry, that should have been reviews. Um, a diverse body of individuals evaluated the restaurant. There's different hours, there's different times. Take into account that lower income neighborhoods and cities would really benefit from positive reviews about local restaurants. So one thing you see from this is that students are thinking about a lot of issues. But I use this example to point out two things to my students when we're going back over this. One is if they look at this corpus of 12 sample solutions we give them, they're going to see that there are a lot of different stakeholders involved in, in something like this, okay? And if you're going to think about the impact of a system, you have to think about its context. Who's affected by this? Um, and if you unpack these a little more, well, there's things like permission issues, right? What, what's available by permissions to each person? who can use the system? What actions are even provided in the system? What data is in the system? And if you unpack the whole set, where you end up with, at least where we end up in my class, is saying, huh, this has to do with model view controller. And so model view controller, for those of you who don't teach software engineering, is a, a general way of thinking about the component structure of a system where you say there's a controller where 
the actual um, algorithms live. There's the model where all of your data lives, and then there's the user interface up front. And what I like to point out to my students is in that list of 12, there are decisions that are under the purview of the UI, whether it's accessibility or who's allowed access to what operations. There's what's in the controller and what, how the algorithms are used to make the ratings. And there's stuff in the model. What data are we storing about people and what are the protections on it? And I think this analogy is useful because I'm already teaching the model view controller as a technical subject in the class. And it's giving them a framework to break down their thinking. I can't give them and say, hey, what are all the threats you think exist in Yelp? They have no grounds for being able to do that analysis. They'll pick up what they know from reading, but that's not actually teaching them anything. That's letting us checkbox that we raised the issue. I actually want to give them systematic ways to think about, teach, about, about this stuff through teaching. So I use this model view controller framing as one to say, hey, look at this piece. What does it control and what might happen? The second level of, of what we're doing on this, and this is getting into some of the research work. I've got a PhD student working on this, where we are going to talk about social impacts as being a form of analysis. I talked about structuring the way they ask questions. I give them this table. Right now, I'm just showing you the rows and columns. I, we'll see contents in a minute. But I tell them that when they're looking at a system or an algorithm or something they're designing, as a first or second year student, right? I'm not talking about professionals, the whole curriculum. I'm just in the first two years. There's issues of fairness and inclusivity. There's issues of privacy and reputation. There's issues of sustainability. And these come up around the data, the algorithms, and who has agency in the tool. So I ask them to stop and say, when you're thinking about threats, I want you to think about what fits in these boxes. What are the inclusivity threats from the data we've collected? What are the privacy threats based on who's permitted to do what with this system? And just to dig a little bit deeper into this, say, privacy reputation cell here. Um, this is an example of what lives in the privacy and reputation row for the actual table I give them. It's a set of prompting questions that they can ask. So for example, are the data protected from leakage and tampering? That's a privacy issue. Under agency, did the stakeholder willingly or knowingly provide their data? Did they know how it be, be used? That's a reputation, privacy, and agency issue. So we give them this table with these prompting questions and now I'll give them an assignment saying, hey, this course project that we've just asked you to build, you're going to build a search engine. I want you to take this row of the table and answer these questions for me and think about what these issues are. I want you to identify the stakeholders. These are things that we can grade them on and we do grade them on. Where is all this coming from? This is coming partly from my past life as someone who used to do work in um, software security. Uh, this is you know, going back about 15 years in my career. I used to teach software security. And one of my favorite things to teach was threat modeling. There are these very clear rubrics and frameworks in the security world for finding threats to the security of a system. They take you through issues like tampering, escalation of privilege, authentication. Okay, And if you're learning how to do a security risk analysis or a threat analysis, you go through and you fill in a table like this and you say, well, here's how this data could be tampered with and whatnot. What we are doing at Brown, and this is what my PhD students actually working on right now, is we are building a framework for social threat model. Taking the inspiration from security, taking what we're hearing and reading about tech ethics and what our colleagues in other departments are telling us and trying to build up this framework so that now we're actually teaching students how to do this instead of leaving them out there. And now again, we're taking some of the, the work off the faculty in terms of saying, how do we talk about this? How do we do this? Well, here are these dimensions. Which one comes up in that assignment you just gave? 
ask the students to report on that and talk to you about it. Okay, um, I got a couple, let me just do the last couple slides and then I'm happy to take whatever other questions people have. First thing I wanna say is pedagogy really matters in all of this stuff. In the early days, we had three or four faculty said, I'm gonna make everybody read the ACM code of ethics and write a paragraph about it. Lee, you're shaking your head. What's wrong with what's wrong with this assignment? Um, yeah, reading the code of ethics is is a real um, exercise in um, pain control or pain management. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it really is inconsistent. It's vague. Um, it's non-specific. Um, I'm sure the people who tried to do this tried very, very, very hard to be very careful, but um, you really can't read it. Uh, without just cringing, sorry. Nor can you have any clue how this is relevant to you. If you read the a ACM Code of Ethics and I ask you to design YouTube, yeah, I shouldn't hurt anybody while I'm doing it. I haven't actually taught you anything. Right. And if you look at this from this perspective of education research, well, in education research, there's an enormous literature on this problem called transfer, which is how do you learn something in one setting pick up those skills and apply them in something else. It is one of the hardest problems in education to get transfer to occur. There are studies showing that if you give students problems in physics, where you walk up a ladder and you drop something to the ground, or you stand on the ground and drop something into the hole, students don't recognize that those are the same question, right? That's the level at which we have to think about helping students transport skills from one area to the other. So with my education hat on, expecting students to read stuff and apply it elsewhere, the education literature is gonna laugh at us. It's not going to work. We have to design our pedagogy to actually help students make these connections. It would help if it was not internally inconsistent as well. It would help if it weren't internally inconsistent as well. And I must say that I have never had the patience to read enough of the ACM Code of Ethics to find the internal inconsistencies. Um, I don't tell my students that, but yeah. So some of the questions that also come up about pedagogy, how do you do this in large courses, right? You can't really have, have discussions. One of the things we're playing with is peer review. You know, like the stuff that we all do on with conference papers and conference managers, you have students write, say, a two-paragraph reflection um, on an essay, and then they get assigned all anonymously, other students' work to look at, and they get to say, oh, well, what did they bring up that I missed, and what did I bring up that they didn't miss? And they get some little anonymous discussion going that way. Uh, sometimes we even seed the pool of papers so that they all get like one really doozy of an example that we crafted to make sure they see something different. Um, but this is something we've been playing with. The other thing faculty say is, well, I give these reading assignments, but what's an effective assignment about reading? And that's what I say, yeah, we are not qualified to know how to ask good questions to prompt student learning through reading, most of us. But that's what the Teaching Center and our humanities colleagues have been doing for a very long time. And that's one of the things we use our experts on is to help us figure out how to ask these questions in good ways. Last point on pedagogy, one thing our students really told us, we've done surveys of students about how this is going. The thing that rung out loud and clear, our students want to hear about these issues from the CS faculty in lecture. They feel that if we outsource this, if we just shove it in homeworks and we never mention it, it's not actually important. They feel if we take a little bit of lecture time to talk about some of this stuff, we are signaling that it actually matters. So we have a responsibility to them to bring this, to bring this up. Not that all of you need to hear that, but this is something we're seeing in our data that, that students really wanna see it from faculty. Okay, I know we're just about out of time. So two quick summary slides. Um, there's a lot of stuff to do still in this area. As we said, we have to help faculty envision themselves doing this work. I think some of progress can be made in the framing. We have to identify exercises that fit into existing courses. 
the Brown ethics webpage, which unfortunately got that name before they decided to recall it responsible computing, has um, the exercises that have been done across a whole bunch of our courses. Um, we've got stuff going on in 14 or 15 courses now. Um, we also have a separate website off of Mozilla funded project that I'm involved in where we're just looking at data structures and algorithms exercises. So that link is there. And there are others. Harvard has their link of exercises and whatnot. So there's lots of resources out there. Also, in terms of work, we're trying to do educational research on effective ways to teach this material, looking both at student and faculty professional development because we want people to believe it's worth the investment. So just to summarize the, the suggestions I made, I think we want to reframe ethics as responsible computing. We want to engage the undergrads to help us build stronger connections to the undergrads with this material. We want to start talking about social impacts as a form of analysis that needs to live on par with time and space analysis. Um, and I think that's something, if we can make that argument in compelling ways, that's a little harder for faculty to, to overlook. And I think we need to weave this material into our technical courses addressed by technical faculty so students can help with the transfer problem. But if we center it in our roles as technical faculty, we know where things can go wrong. We just have to figure out how to explain them and present them to students and stop thinking it's about kind of ethics and politics. Uh, sorry, I finished right on the nose there, but you know, I'm happy to take whatever questions you all have time for. So Kathy and all, there's another session that's starting at four o'clock, um, which many people have signed up for, and that is intended to be a sort of an open discussion. Okay. With you. Um, so I think if there is a shortish question now, that would be a totally reasonable thing, but um, for longer things, and I know I have a few really long conversations I'd like to have, um, uh, we, I think, invite and encourage everybody to you know move over to the seminar at four o'clock where we all have this conversation. And I just uh, posted the uh, registration link in the uh, Zoom chat. Um, so um, if, you you, if you click on that, I think then you, you are registered and then they'll send you the, uh, send you the link to the, uh, to the four o'clock session. Um, there was, uh, <laughs> yeah, there, there's a lot to talk about. Um, uh, Yvonne uh, just, posted in, in the Zoom chat. I started uh, writing some social responsibility facets and skills. What do you think is something missing? All right, can you see that, Kathy? I can. I only just realized that the chat was separate from the Q&A. So um, yeah, I, I just sort of fired, it, it just fired up a few there minutes ago. Yeah. At, the, at the beginning, I'm sorry. Um, accessibility, diversity, impact on others, freedoms. Let's see, something missing. It's going to take me a little while to unpack whether something's missing, but I think that's certainly a pretty good, um, there's a pretty good starter list in there. Um, well, before um, the time gets past us and people start dropping out, can we all thank Kathy for what I think was a really, really insightful, uh, stimulating talk. And thanks so much. Yeah, thanks yeah, again. Thank for you writing. very much. Um, why, why don't we start again at 4.05, just to give Kathy a few minutes to recover and for people to register and show up in the, uh, in the next location. Okay, hopefully we'll see everybody uh, in five minutes. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. This has been really fascinating and Wonderful just talk, Kathy. bursting with ideas. <laughs>